tonight. The plot thickens in Ottawa. We did hear from the former Attorney General yesterday, Mr. Speaker, and now we want to hear from the Prime Minister, the man who stands accused of major political interference in a criminal case. As Andrew Scheer calls for a criminal investigation of Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister's former top aide is ready to speak his truth. Not a lot of mums out there, such as myself, knew that rice had arsenic. Investigating a common ingredient in baby food. What Canadian families need to know about rice. It's a lot of just nastiness, uh, name calling. And why Meghan Markle has become the target of online hate. How some are trying to shield her. This is The National. One day after Jody Wilson-Raybould gave her blistering account of backroom liberal politics, the Trudeau government's biggest scandal to date has taken new twists. Remember, the former Attorney General alleged that the Prime Minister and key figures around him put inappropriate pressure on her, even used veiled threats to defer the criminal prosecution of the Quebec-based engineering giant SNC-Lavalin. The opposition says that pressure might itself constitute a crime. We'll have more on that in a moment. But first, David Cochran starts our coverage with the government's rebuttal. Yeah. The Prime Minister started the day wanting to talk about outer space. But the questions were all about events in his political orbit. There are disagreements in perspective on this, but I can reassure Canadians that we were doing our job. That's the Liberal line. This is all a difference of opinion. So another key player will try to drive that home. Jerry Butts, the Prime Minister's former top advisor who resigned last week, has now asked to testify at the Justice Committee. I believe my evidence will be of assistance. I need a short period of time to receive legal advice to be able to produce relevant documents to the committee. Butts featured prominently in Wilson Raybould's version of events. She recounted a December 5th meeting at the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. I wanted to speak about a number of things, including up bringing up SNC and the barrage of people hounding me and my staff. He said I needed to find a solution. Later, on December 18th, Wilson Raybould's chief of staff, Jessica Prince, met with Butts and the Prime Minister's chief, Katie Telford, a meeting Prince detailed to Wilson Raybould in text messages. Jerry said, quote, Jess, there is no solution here that does not involve some interference, end quote. The committee is also bringing back clerk of the Privy Council Michael Wernick. Canada's top civil servant testified previously that he had a key phone call with Wilson Raybould on December 19th. So I can tell you with complete assurance that my view of those conversations is that they were within the boundaries of what's lawful and appropriate. She viewed it quite differently. I believe that there were three occasions in that conversation where there was a veiled threat. Uh, Mr. Wernick's testimony from last Thursday was uh, completely demolished. Uh, if uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould's version of events is true, Mr. Wernick is a liar. The committee isn't just recalling Wernick, it's asking the Deputy Minister of Justice, Natalie Drouin, to come back as well. Wilson Rabel testified that the clerk and her then deputy had a phone call that suggests she lost her job as Justice Minister because of the standoff with the Prime Minister. The call took place three days before the cabinet shuffle. As part of this conversation, the clerk tells the deputy that one of the first conversations that the new minister will be expected to have with the prime minister will be on SNC Lavalin. All of that will play out in public next week, while in private, the prime minister will decide if Wilson Raybould can stay in the Liberal caucus. I have, uh, I have uh, taken, uh, taken knowledge of, uh, of her testimony and there's still uh, reflections to have on uh, next steps. David, you've done some digging into the, those next steps. What are you hearing? Yeah, Ian, CBC News has learned that the Prime Minister is going to shuffle his cabinet on Friday morning. This is something we knew was going to happen eventually because of that vacancy Jody Wilson-Raybould created when she resigned as Minister of Veterans Affairs. And ever since then, Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan has been doing double duty. Well, what a high-level source tells me tonight is that this is going to be a small shuffle. Only a handful of ministers are moving to fill that vacancy. And if you're a backbencher waiting at home for a phone call tonight about a promotion, I got some bad news. The source tells me no new ministers going into cabinet. This is only a shuffle of existing ministers that will be rolled out tomorrow, Ian.
Okay, David, thank you. You're welcome. One big question in all of this, does the pressure alleged by Wilson-Raybould amount to a crime? Here's Katie Simpson with the legal arguments. The former attorney general says from her perspective, no one dealing with the SNC-Lavalin affair broke the law. But not everyone agrees with her legal opinion. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer is urging police to investigate. In a letter to the RCMP commissioner, he outlined two sections of the criminal code he says have been violated. The intent to provoke fear in the attorney general and the attempt to obstruct or defeat the course of justice. Tonight, five former attorneys general echoed that call. Four conservatives and one NDP wrote their own letter to the commissioner, saying ordinary Canadians who do not benefit from political connections have been charged under these sections with much less evidence. I do think there's, there's enough there that it's not an outrageous allegation that the RCMP should at least look at it. This lawyer says based on what he's heard so far from Jody Wilson-Raybould, the concerns about obstruction of justice appear most significant. I think there's enough of a basis for at least an investigation because what has happened uh, could speak to a conspiratorial intent uh, to obstruct justice, for example. Making that kind of argument in court would be a difficult task, according to the head of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. You need to have evidence that the Prime Minister intended to uh, obstruct justice, and we didn't hear any of that. Though not criminal, Michael Bryant says there's been inappropriate behaviour from both sides of this story. They should have stopped trying to bend her to their will. At the same time, she needed to be open-minded to the legal arguments and the facts and the evidence, and she clearly wasn't. So it's a pox on both their houses. To our knowledge, uh, no one has been contacted by the RCMP. The Prime Minister suggested today a police investigation is not necessary and that the Justice Committee and Ethics Commissioner's probes are good enough. Officials in the RCMP are reviewing Andrew Scheer's letter, but they refuse to confirm or deny whether an investigation is underway. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So we've heard political and legal interpretations of all of this. What do potential voters think? Here's a sample from some people on the street and on local radio, starting in Jody Wilson-Raybould's own riding of Vancouver Granville. I'm upset. The law should be independent from the policy, politics. She definitely said no, no laws were broken. I think we need more clarification from all parties. Uh, why don't they get, come right out and say they're fighting for jobs for people in Quebec and Ontario and they couldn't give a crap about the rest of the country. I think it could turn into something a lot bigger. Yeah, and impact the election for sure. There is a flaw in the system that you can have a partisan attorney general who's not supposed to be partisan, who has a micro folder, but has a minister's position of justice, which is a macro folder, and who's supposed to be pulling for her party. It's up to the people to judge. And how Canadians ultimately judge this scandal could depend on a few factors. Their own politics, their knowledge of the law, even perhaps where they live. Much has been said about the Prime Minister's relationship to Montreal and SNC-Lavalin. Alison Northcott explores the view from Quebec. In Justin Trudeau's diverse Montreal riding of Papineau, opinions vary over the SNC-Lavalin scandal. We're voting for someone to be open, open books, but it seems like it's not so... I don't think I'll be voting for him again. I will do a vote for him again. You will vote for him Yes, again. I'm a huge voter. Uh, my opinion of uh, the Prime Minister has obviously diminished a little bit. I hear those things and uh, people talking both sides sometimes. Do you believe one version of events over the other? From the beginning, well, I, I some Quebec think politicians, think pundits and members of the public have supported giving SNC-Lavalin a deal. We have had half versions, we have had denials. But some say Trudeau has simply failed to explain to Canadians why it's so important to save those 9,000 jobs and that Wilson Raybould's testimony makes things worse. I think it will hurt him everywhere in Canada and it will hurt him less probably because there's more sympathy to it towards uh, Sensi-Lavalin, but I think it will hurt him uh, here too. Quebec's Premier says the testimony has raised questions. I don't know what happened uh, between uh, Mr. Trudeau uh, and uh, the former Minister of Justice. I don't know what kind of pressure he 
output. But he says his main concern is keeping the company and its jobs in Quebec. His own justice minister, though, has graver concerns. It is troubling because I, I very deeply believe in uh, our institutions. I really deeply believe in the rule of law. And without taking sides, if what was said is true, it's troubling. She says she will not interfere with decisions made by Quebec's public prosecutors for SNC-Lavalin or any file. Tout le monde a raison, tout le monde a tort. Meanwhile, many, like this woman, feel caught in the middle of a complicated story and are waiting for clarity. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. With such a complicated story, we asked what you want to know, and you didn't hold back. So we're going to try to get answers to all of those questions. What does Trudeau have to do to get past this SNC-Lavalin fiasco? Do you think that this scandal will register with the average voter in the upcoming election? Why has she not resigned as a member of the Liberal Caucus? Andrew Chantel and Paul are going to tackle your questions. We have another special ad issue coming up. But let's go to Toronto now. Adrian, you're looking at a story that the government wanted to talk about today. Yeah, Ian, safe to say with everything going on this week, the Liberals were very happy to claim a win. To celebrate this moment, the introduction of Bill C-92, we have finally arrived at this historic day. Okay, self-congratulations aside, Bill C-92 would completely overhaul Indigenous child welfare, effectively turning it over to Indigenous communities themselves and pledging new funding. The government noted that while only 7% of Canada's children are Indigenous, they represent more than half of the country's children in foster care, something that the bill, backed by First Nations leaders, aims to change. For many Indigenous people, the changes cannot come fast enough, especially those whose lives have been shaped by the old system. But as Olivia Stefanovic tells us, they are wary of what may happen next. Miigwech. 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 Tessa Quadrigan relies on an app to teach her son Cree, an opportunity she mind. didn't have growing up in the child welfare system. It wasn't taught to me. It should have been. And I wish it was, because now I try to give that to my son without really knowing it myself. She lost more than her language and a sense of culture. She's trying to regain her faith in others. It was isolating, and I was, I questioned a lot. Her experience with child welfare is multi-generational. She almost lost custody of her son as well, when he was staying with his dad, who died of an overdose. I needed to come and fight for him. So when I did, the first initial meetings were awful. <laughs> there was very, like, guilt shaming when I had been in shock myself. She believes it would have been different if her First Nation had been in control. That's the goal behind the new federal legislation. It seeks to keep children and youth with their families and in their communities. I'm hoping that this way this new legislation will help that not happen to anybody else. Her expectations are high. So too are Miranda Egertson's, a friend who spent years bouncing through the system. It's a fight to, to feel secure every day. And she has and many questions about Bill C-92. It, it does sound hopeful, but like how many times has our people heard stuff like this? Cautiously, they wait to see changes, but with just 10 weeks left before the House breaks for summer and a looming federal election, politicians have little time to spare to push through this major reform. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. And some advocates also have concerns about how funding will work under this new arrangement. The federal government still has to sort that out with the provinces. Overseas now and to the big nuclear summit that just fizzled. Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un seemingly went to Vietnam to make a deal. They even scheduled in a signing ceremony and instead it all fell apart. Now each side blames the other. But while there's disagreement over the degree of responsibility, as Paul Hunter tells us, sanctions were the sticking point. Bottom line, as Donald Trump left Vietnam this morning, it was without an agreement. Despite earlier optimism, no deal on denuclearization with North Korea's Kim Jong-un. Basically, uh, they wanted the sanctions lifted. 
in their entirety, and we couldn't do that. Barely had Trump given his version when North Korea countered, not true. Its view, North Korea offered to shutter its main nuclear complex if sanctions were to be merely eased. Whatever the truth on why it all fell apart, said Trump. Sometimes you have to walk, and uh, this was just one of those times. Back in the U.S., where some had worried Trump might give too much in his eagerness for a deal, a thumbs up even from top Democrat Nancy Pelosi. I'm glad that the president walked away from that. But Kim got this much engagement with a U.S. president for all the world to see. He even took a reporter's question before it all broke down. Might he allow an official U.S. office in North Korea? Well, I think that is something which is welcomable. So, did Kim come away a winner anyway, simply because of optics like this? Those are certainly benefits for him. Says Obama-era diplomat and Korea's expert Mintaro Oba, truth is, Kim wanted a deal, and like Trump, he ended up without one. And while that's not going to be advertised broadly to the North Korean people, I think perhaps it will uh, weaken his position a little with elites in Pyongyang. The key question, where does this go from here? After all the talk of making history, they didn't. The U.S. said today there could be more meetings, but none are planned. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. A major announcement about Canada's space strategy. The Prime Minister unveiled it at the Canadian Space Agency's headquarters in Quebec. Canada is going to the moon. This country will be part of NASA's new Lunar Gateway project, an outpost that will orbit the moon and allow astronauts to conduct lunar expeditions. Canada will be developing a robotic system to be known as Canadarm3. It will help repair and maintain the outpost. This is the largest initiative for Canada's space program in more than a decade, injecting some $2 billion into the space sector over 24 years. I'm going to serve you as a president for many years. Israel's Prime Minister dismissed allegations of wrongdoing and vowed to stay in office after the country's Attorney General said he will indict Benjamin Netanyahu. The charges include bribery, fraud and breach of trust. If a court doesn't stop the proceeding, it will mark the first time a sitting Israeli Prime Minister has been charged with a crime. The country's general election is set for April 9th. There's not much I can say uh, other than it was very productive. As I said, I'm committed to telling the truth. Michael Cohen, U.S. President Donald Trump's former personal lawyer, will get another chance to do that. After a closed-door session today, he'll return next Wednesday to finish testifying in front of the U.S. House Intelligence Committee. It's looking into Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election. Ahead tonight, why is Meghan Markle the target of so much hatred online? And Ad Issue is here to answer your questions about the SNC-Lavalin story. But first, a CBC Marketplace investigation, what is really in the baby food? I think it's surprising because uh, not a lot of mums out there, such as myself, knew that rice had arsenic. What do you think wow. about that? That's scary, <laughs> to be honest with you. This week in a joint investigation, Marketplace and Radio Canada take a closer look at what you're feeding your baby. Our intent as mothers is to provide our babies with good, wholesome foods that are going to help their development and growth. So the team tested popular infant cereals and snacks and found higher levels of one particular toxin lurking in the mix. And as Magda Gabrasolasa tells us, a popular grain might just be the source. These babies have worked up quite the appetite. As for what they're eating, there's a list of options. We started with uh, rice cereal because a pediatrician recommended uh, rice cereal. He likes his snacks, so like puffs. Rice cereal first at five months. Turns out there's something else in the mix, arsenic. It's a naturally occurring toxin that's in the water and soil. It can also come from industrial and agricultural runoff. The most toxic kind is called inorganic arsenic. 
Research shows that rice absorbs more arsenic than other grains. And rice is one of the most popular grains in baby foods. So what does that mean for baby food? Marketplace did several tests of seven kinds of infant cereal and seven kinds of snacks. We found rice products had the highest levels of arsenic. Baby Gourmet Creamy Brown Rice Cereal and PC Organic Puffs had the highest in our test. Both are Canadian companies. I think it's surprising because uh, not a lot of mums out there, such as myself, knew that rice had arsenic. Research has linked arsenic to an increased risk of cancer over time and might affect a child's neurocognitive development. Taking action, Europe set a legal limit for inorganic arsenic in baby food of 100 parts per billion. Our tests show baby gourmet creamy brown rice had an average of 125 parts per billion, and PC Organic Puffs had around 170. Andrew Maharg is one of the world's leading arsenic experts. I do not recommend giving children food products with such high levels of arsenic in them. Maharg says these products would be illegal in Europe. However, they're on store shelves across Canada. Here, there are no set limits for arsenic in baby food. Health Canada says it's been looking at arsenic in food and drinks for 10 years, but only now is it looking at setting limits on rice products, including those for children. Testing these two products will be part of the process. If we find that they're consistently high, we do what we call a health risk assessment. We can do a variety of different things, all the way up to taking it off the market if need be, if there's a risk there. As for the other products we tested, they all fell below the EU limit. We shared our results with both Baby Gourmet and PC Organics. They provided statements. Baby Gourmet said its team is currently reviewing the new information provided to us by CBC Marketplace, as the standards used in some countries around the world differ from the Canadian guidelines we follow. Meanwhile, PC Organics, which is owned by Loblaws, assures its customers that its products are safe, but it's also committing to reducing the arsenic. We are working with our suppliers to minimize these trace levels and will use European standards as our guide. Magda Gebrasselasse, CBC News, Toronto. So you might now be wondering, what about the rice we all eat? Well, higher levels of arsenic have been found in that too, but there are a couple things you can do to reduce your exposure. Apparently, try rinsing your rice really well and cooking it in a lot of water, kind of like pasta. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration says using 10 parts water to one part rice can reduce arsenic content by about 60%. Another tip, just switch things up. Add lower arsenic grains into your diet, like quinoa, bulgur, and farro. You can watch the full Marketplace investigation tomorrow night on CBC Television starting at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland. Straight ahead, you sent us your questions on the SNC-Lavalin controversy. At issue, we'll answer some of them next. And a little later, bullying the Duchess of Sussex. We'll look at who's really behind the online vitriol aimed at Meghan Markle. There's no shortage of, of negative things that people are saying. There's a lot of just nastiness, uh, name-calling, uh, but also this growing sense of conspiracy theory. There was a sustained um, effort and attempt to politically interfere with my discretion. She approached me in the House of Commons to inform me that my staff was speaking to her staff, which I think is entirely appropriate. What we need to do is get to the truth, and that's what a public inquiry will do. He stands accused of political interference in a criminal case. There is a process, both at the Justice Committee and indeed uh, at the Ethics Commissioner, uh, that will uh, make a determination on uh, what actually happened here. So, as you heard, various people sticking to their interpretation of what happened there, and the opposition has more questions. So, what is next in the SNC-Lavalin controversy, and how do people across the country feel? We'll put some of your questions to the Ad Issue panel. Chantal Lavert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne in Toronto, and Paul Wells also in Toronto. So, we've had... A little more than 24 hours since uh, the testimony yesterday. There have been new developments, but, but now that we had a little bit of chance to kind of sit back and listen and watch, I want to get a sense of how you feel things are playing out tonight. And uh, Paul, let's begin with you. 
Well, last night, um, I'm told on social media, it was uh, possible to read all kinds of people saying, well, that's it, the Liberal Party's going to fall apart, they're going to fall on, on Justin Trudeau, it's uh, uh, open warfare. Um, that hasn't happened. The Liberal antibodies in the early going are kicking in the way they normally do. Partisans going to partisan, and in an election year, uh, they will be quick to remind themselves that the alternative to Justin Trudeau is not Christian Freeland or some imaginary, even better Liberal leader. It's uh, Andrew Scheer, and they really don't like Andrew Scheer. They figure he, they, they have convinced themselves that he's dangerous for the country. So, uh, so what are they going to do in response? I'm given to understand they're going to uh, now attack Jody Wilson-Raybould's credi credibility. That is not what I would advise them to do. I expect that uh, it'll be harder than they think it will be, and uh, and it will. Um, it will serve up the spectacle of liberals attacking liberals that they had uh, so far spent 36 hours avoiding. Chantel? I also think that, uh, uh, and I did see the same thing on social media and in emails, uh, the liberal reflex kicking up. Uh, someone asked, do you really, do you think, or don't you think there will be a putsch and they will replace uh, Justin Trudeau? And uh, I see no evidence of that happening. But I still think many Canadians, including uh, a lot of people who voted Liberal in 2015 expect more from the Prime Minister uh, than what they've been seeing so far, snippets here and there uh, as he's doing other things. Uh, and his, his former Principal Secretary today is asked and will be testifying in front of the Justice Committee, and that's all fine. But at the end of the day, uh, to respond to a sitting or a former sitting minister, I think a lot of people want to hear Justin Trudeau and not just uh, saying there's nothing to this and there's a process in place. Andrew, last night on Ad Issue and uh, also in your opinion piece, you're very strong on the fact that, uh, that you felt Wilson Rabel's testimony uh, spoke to a, a real problem, a, a, a crisis for the government. Your thoughts tonight? Well, and, and I wasn't the only one. I guess that's the point. Is she has clearly moved the needle on this. People who might previously have been more sympathetic to the government's line in this or more skeptical of her uh, complaints, uh, I think we're, if you look at many of the columnists, for example, people moved off that position to finding her very credible. And partly because of her own demeanor, her own dignity, but also because of the documentation that she brought to the table as well. So it is not going to be sufficient. It is clearly not sufficient for the Prime Minister to continue with the line he's taken all the way along this of just basically blanket denials or half denials or non-denial denials that don't actually get at the nub of this. Uh, it's obviously uh, uh, too, way too soon to be talking about the Prime Minister resigning or being a, a coup within the party. But it's also uh, way too late for them to be coming forward much for the, further than they have and having much more transparency. And as I said before, we need to hear all of the principal players in this, all the main people that were named in Ms. Wilson-Raybould's testimony need to be make their own testimony. So it's great to see Jerry Butts coming forward. I think we need to hear from all of them. Now, Andrew Scheer, the opposition leader, last night said that uh, the Prime Minister should resign. Today, he upped the ante by uh, sending a letter to the RCMP and saying that there ought to be uh, a criminal investigation. Uh, Andrew, is that reasonable or does that go too far, do you think? It's not unreasonable in itself. There, it is not entirely clear, uh, to my session anyway, to the degree I've you know, talked to lawyers and, and read other lawyers, this, it's, it's unlikely to rise to the level of obstruction of justice, but it's not entirely clear that it doesn't. So my own view would be that is something that the RCMP can figure out well enough on their own. Uh, I don't think they necessarily need advice uh, from the leader of the opposition or anybody else. So that's mostly a stunt uh, on Andrew Scheer's part, as was the, the demand for the Prime Minister to resign today. I mean, we need to hear from all sides on this. Ms. Wilson-Raybould made a very compelling testimony, but the people that she accused deserve their day in court, their chance to rebut that, but they got to step forward. Uh, but, uh, and the RCMP will do what they're going to do, and, and we'll just have to see. Well, I, I note uh, that uh, neither of the main opposition parties is calling for an election to allow Canadians to pass judgment on everything that they, is being put to them. They could, uh, and, and I suspect the only way that there will be closure on this is uh, by a Justin Trudeau restoring his moral authority by winning another mandate or someone else assuming power. And I suspect the reason that uh, no one is calling for that and instead calling for the impossible to obtain prime ministerial resignation is because neither of the opposition party is game to go in an election between now and the end of April. 
So we put the call out yesterday for people to uh, tell us if they have questions, and we got an unusual number of responses. And, and among those responses, a lot of thoughtful questions. Uh, we're going to play some of those now, and let's start with what Kevin White asked. Given the prospect of SNC-Lavalin being banned from bidding on government contracts and potentially failing or moving overseas, realistically, had any other political party been in power, would they have done things any differently? So, Paul, the curtain here was raised. We got to uh, to hear about interactions between cabinet ministers and senior staff that maybe we don't always hear. And so a lot of people are wondering, maybe this always happens and the only difference is we're getting to hear about it in this one particular case. So I spent a, l a large part of the day trying to decide whether it is naive of me to think that it should have been possible while Justin Trudeau was sending staffers in waves to tell Jody Wilson-Raybould this was about jobs, this was about uh, economic and political reality, that maybe somebody could have told Canadians that. Because the only glimpse that Canadians had that this was coming down the pike was one paragraph on page 202 of last spring's federal budget. And what it said is, we're going to get tougher on corporate wrongdoers, we're going to increase their accountability, not we're going to serve up uh, a, a last-minute change to the criminal code, code that SNC-Lavalin has spent millions of dollars begging us to implement. Uh, if, uh, if they were so all-fired realistic about things, they forgot to tell Canadians. And that's, that's, that's the thing that I'm getting angrier about as the days go on. Chantal, are you getting angry? <laughs> I don't uh, do the angry thing. <laughs> it, it gets in the way of, of thinking, I find. Uh, but uh, I think any responsible government of any uh, party would have uh, tried to see whether it could mitigate damage to a major employer that uh, is responsible for 9,000 jobs across the country, only half of them in Quebec, for the record. I don't know that they would have proceeded the same way. Paul is quite right. That process was convoluted. Uh, but the opposition parties could also have rung alarm bells. It was not totally hidden. And uh, I don't think uh, either the Conservatives or the NDP really wanted to have a fight over, with the Liberals over SNC-Lavalin. This is a, a result of circumstances and personalities more so than the opposition looking for evidence of something happening with SNC-Lavalin that they wanted to fight over. What I hope will come out of this is that this will reinforce what ought to have been a, a pretty solid taboo, that you don't go messing with the independence of an attorney general or with the prosecutorial discretion of independent prosecutors. That's why the director of prosecutions, public prosecutions was put into law, was to be independent. Uh, so to the extent anybody is contemplating that, I hope that this episode will stop them from doing so. But look, the premise that this was going to lead to the collapse of SNC, I think should be, SNC Lavalin should be viewed with a great deal of skepticism. I think this had much more to do with increasing its bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the prosecutors, had much more to do with where the headquarters was going to be located, these kinds of political questions and not these kind of apocalyptic scenarios where the whole, comp the whole company goes under. I want to move on to uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould because we've got a lot of questions about her, her, her strategies, her motives. Uh, here's a question from Alex Thompson. With all that Jody Wilson-Raybould has gone through up until this point, including her seeming loss of confidence with the PM, why has she not resigned as a member of the Liberal Caucus? Who wants to answer that, Andrew? Why should she? Uh, that's not, you, you don't have to be uh, a, a paid up believer in the Prime Minister's leadership and in the particular conduct of the people around him to be a member of the Liberal Party or she was elected as a Liberal. I would say that's much more to do with what her a riding association and what her electors believe than whether or not she's on the same page as the Prime Minister on any given issue. So Paul, another version of that question that we saw a lot of from viewers was if Jody Wilson-Raybould had not been demoted or you know her cabinet uh, position hadn't changed, uh, maybe this never would have become public. So should we look at this with any kind of cynicism in terms of her motive? I don't, I don't think you need Jody Wilson-Raybould to be the purest hero in the history of Canadian politics to believe that she asked uh, some uh, serious questions and raised some important information last night. Um, you know, so the question is, why didn't she quit immediately when she felt the pressure? Uh, it seems to me that she stayed in the job from the, from the last part of December to the first part of January because she had reason to believe she'd won the argument. She, they had come at her and come at her and come at her and come at her and said, 
you've got to do this. And she said no. And then she went home for Christmas. It wasn't until the first week in January when, when, when they told her that she was, she was moving. Why did she not quit during those 15 days? Well, because it was the holidays. Let's finish with this, maybe 30 seconds from each of you, beginning with you, Paul. What should the Liberals do? What can the Liberals do to repair the damage, especially over the next week or so? Um, I, I would advise them against uh, further rounds of infighting. Uh, they, the, the, the former AG made um, <coughs> allegations about a dozen people. If they did not hold those meetings, if they were not uh, in those rooms, then they should say so. And if they have records that suggest that they didn't, they spoke in a different tone or with different content, then, then, th then they're free to contest that. But it sounds like she's got them dead to rights. And uh, I, I would encourage this government and this prime minister to look inside. Why were you so disingenuous for so long about what was plainly such a major issue for you and everybody working for you? Why can't you tell Canadians what you're doing in there? Andrew? Uh, I agree that the only thing that's going to save them, if it's, if it's going to save them, is transparency. There's, there's no, there's no p percentages anymore in the stonewalling strategy. It hasn't worked for them. It's not going to work for them. I think there's going to be some officials in that government who, are, who should be polishing up their resumes. Uh, whether that's going to include the prime minister will be a political decision for the party. Probably not. But I think there may be some other people who are going to be, going to be departing. And Chantal, last word to you. I expect that we're going to hear a repeat of uh, the clerk's uh, initial testimony. I was struck today by the fact that uh, in the House, no one questioned the, the, the bare facts. Uh, everyone is trying to set their sights on interpretation. So I'm not so sure that you can mount a, a very strong defense uh, that goes beyond do you believe her or do you find the prime minister more credible. But I do think they need to put the prime minister in a setting maybe not the committee, where he does answer more fully uh, the questions that are being put to him and in a way that shows something beyond uh, code words. It's been another incredible week and a story that keeps on surprising us. Thanks to uh, all of you. And before we go, be sure to subscribe to the Ad Issue podcast for extra content. This week, we're talking about those federal by-elections. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, and on our website, cbcnews.ca slash the National. Up next on The National, why is Meghan Markle the target of online trolls? We'll look at the efforts to counteract all that hate. Think, would you say that in public? And if you wouldn't say it in public, don't write it. It's hiding behind your computer screen. Whether it's Will and Kate tending bar in Belfast or Harry and Meghan trying local cuisine in Morocco, as usual, the young royals drew crowds of fans this week. Their personal appeal among the family's greatest assets. In fact, a recent poll found Prince Harry is now the most popular royal of all time, eclipsing even the Queen. But while his wife scored highly too, Meghan Markle has also become a magnet for abuse. Our Kayla Hounsell examines a growing campaign of hate and what's being done to fight it. Since marrying into the royal family, Meghan Markle has become one of the most watched women in the world, her every move under scrutiny. But now, at least online, the attention has turned from a general interest in the new royal to unpleasant, distasteful and racist comments. Is it my imagination, or does Meghan Markle all of a sudden look like she's trying to be blacker, tweets one person. Posts show Markle carrying bananas on her head and pit the Duchess of Sussex and the Duchess of Cambridge against one another. And the online hatred toward the Duchess of Sussex is growing in both volume and viciousness. So help us understand what we're looking at here. Okay, so this is kind of, this is our Visio screens. Uh, they help us to visualize the data that we have. Gemma Joyce is a social data journalist. She noticed so much nastiness about Meghan Markle online that she decided to dig deep into the vitriol to see who's saying what. I mean, there's no shortage of, of negative things that people are saying. There's a lot of just nastiness. 
The most popular hashtag around the conversation is Megxit, a play on Brexit. People want Meghan Markle to leave the way Britain is leaving the European Union. This graph shows how that conversation has grown since the beginning of the year. Then there's hashtag Moonbump, which targets Meghan's baby bump. Theory going around that she is faking her pregnancy, which to me sounds a little bit mad, but there's all kinds of proof that people are sharing online, all these pictures uh, circling folds in her clothing and stuff like that. The Duchess and Prince Harry are expecting their first child this spring. The data shows 80% of the negativity toward Meghan is coming from women, and the majority are not from the UK. And as you can see, the US is a huge driver of that conversation. Um, the UK is just after that, and I think at number three is Canada. Hello Magazine, which covers the royals heavily, also noticed the cruelty on its own social channels. Indeed, it's a very so sorry state of affairs. And when Kensington Palace revealed it is spending hours every week trying to delete the posts, Hello launched Hello to Kindness. Think, would you say that in public? And if you wouldn't say it in public, don't write it, hiding behind your computer screen. We're a family magazine and want people just to be nice to each other. The campaign has drawn support from some big names, including Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York. In an open letter, she wrote that people also tried to portray her and the late Princess Diana as rivals, although they never really felt that way. The hate being spewed online is one thing, but there has also been criticism of Meghan Markle's treatment by the British press. Meghan is black and she's been divorced and she's an independent woman and I think people find that threatening. We've seen how it ends, you know, what happened to Diana. Give them some peace. <laughs> they have, I mean, she's expecting a baby. Indeed, there has been a lot of coverage, ranging from stories about the Duchess being difficult to work for to the feud between Meghan and her dad and her pricey baby shower with friends in New York City. It prompted her best friends to open up to People magazine, albeit anonymously, defending her as a wonderful person. George Clooney also came to her defense, saying the Duchess is being pursued and vilified the way Diana was. I don't think it's been overtly negative. I don't think it's been um, disproportionate. This royal correspondent says times have changed and the comparison to Diana is unfair. She points out the royals are subsidized by taxpayers and play an official role. Largely, I think Fleet Street sees itself as a critical friend of the royals. If they do great things, let's celebrate them. If they make mistakes, let's highlight them. But Hello has taken a different stand. The magazine is unapologetically refusing to report any negative stories about the Markle family. We heard that it was upsetting to the Dutch and Sussex. We took an editorial judgment, as we are allowed to do, not to report any of it, and we sort of stand by this decision. Gemma Joyce points out that while there is a lot of online abuse, there are Megan supporters. They have a hashtag too. They're the Megulators. A lot of people are really supportive of Megan, so it's not, it's not that um, you know the trolls are really winning. Um, but at the same time, just looking at the kind of hatred around it is, is quite depressing, really. And while there are efforts to stop and delete hurtful posts, they're no match for the ease and rapid speed of social media. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. Next on The National, 13 years, five letters, two girls, and one fantastic coincidence. We'll tell you about an unlikely reunion in our moment. Right away, I just had that urge to ask her. I was like, I feel like I know you, and I, where are you from? Like, I just, all these mind, uh, thoughts were racing through my mind. This glove is brown. My shoes are black. What exactly are we doing here? We're gonna practice? Practice what? You told me I was just a body in a field. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Mr. Rose. Whoa. What are you doing? Well, what are you doing? Thirteen years ago, two little girls bonded over a shared love of sport and science. They were pen pals, one in Ontario, the other in Belize. Eventually, though, they grew up and grew apart. That is until the oddest of coincidences. They both ended up on the same small university campus in Newfoundland in the same class with the same master's advisor. The story of their reunion and their friendship is tonight's moment. I went up to her and I said, are you from Belize? I went home and I found my letters and I brought them into her. Oh, I was completely 
shocked, especially when she brought me the the letters that I wrote. I still have my letters from Melissa. It just brought back the memories very vividly. I remember sitting down in the class actually coloring and drawing out those pictures. I was in Mississauga when I wrote these letters and she was in Belize and we both ended up in Newfoundland. Like what are the chances of that? We see each other pretty much every other day. Uh, we, we hang out with the same people. We're talking about the same sorts of science. Yeah, we're in the same classes. And I mean, like, it's really easy to build a friendship with Heather. She's such a sweet person. You have to believe in fate or something. I definitely believe it was fate. 13 years later, we're the closest we've ever been. Okay, I, I, I am so in love with this story. I, I know we've been talking about it for a while. All week we've had stories that could be movies of the week, so script writers yeah. out there start writing this one. And, and I know that you and I don't entirely disagree uh, on this part of it. I, I happen to believe sometimes things are meant to be. You know, Heather had an instinct that she recognized that name. She saw, uh, she asked about it. It came to be, and I, I don't know. Sometimes I think there's a reason for it. I, I love the fact that you and I have so much in common, you know, the overlapping traits, but there are a few very distinct differences. And <laughs> I, I love that you embrace the romance of fate, but to me, unfortunately, I'm stuck with the, the world of chance. I think it was just against all odds, just a random chance. But it's still a beautiful story with a beautiful end. And I love you anyway. <laughs> okay, me too, you. <laughs> that is The National for February 28th. Good night. Good night. <laughs>